Well, hey there, idioms. Welcome back to Observe. And in today's video, we're going to be analyzing the nonverbal communication again of John Wayne Gacy. This is part three of the three part series. If you haven't seen the other two parts, I do suggest you go and check those out first. It'll help add some context to this one. Let's go ahead and roll the intro for now, though. Things. I wanted to go ahead and give a quick shout out to the fact that we've made some merch over at Observe. If you would like to be able to go down into the description, check out the links there. There's a link tree. It links all the different socials and merch and things like that. Go check those out. That's all that I've got. I, I, I would appreciate it. Let's go ahead and actually start into the, the content of the video. Look, let's step back to, let, let's step back to, to your childhood. What was your state of health as a child? It I'm going to go ahead and pause that there because right off the bat, let's step back to your childhood and immediately Gacy begins to have a little bit of contempt come in with one side of his face raising up there and it's not synchronized across both half. That is usually an indicator of contempt. Let's see what his response is to that because he's already kind of showing a low level of moral or intellectual superiority in this point. At the age of 10, I was told I had a uh, enlarged bottleneck heart. Okay. And so I uh, had a tendency to pass out a lot. How about childhood illnesses? Did you have any, I mean, uh, accidents rather, any any sort of uh, I was injuries or accidents? When I went to uh, the other vocational school, when I first went to the vocational school, I got hit with a park swing in the side of the head, caused a mass strike. At what, what age was that? Approximately. 14, I believe. Got hit with a swing, were you unconscious? Yeah, I was taken to a medical clinic. Okay. So from what I'm hearing, he had some medical difficulties as he was growing up. Now this story with the park swing is fascinating to me. I don't, whew, I don't know what kind of park swings they had back then, but they were hefty. I've been hit by a park swing with a human being on it before and was not knocked out and taken to specifically a medical clinic. That is fascinating. I'm not sure why he's including these parts into this, this narrative, but it is helping us understand a little bit more about John Wayne Gacy's past and the, the formation that brought us to where we are now. Let's continue. That was at the time. That's when I started seeing that I had epilepsy. Uh -huh. did, did you have any uh, episodes of, uh, you know, uh, seizures? Seizures, yeah. Seizures were, uh, according to the doctor, they claimed that when I have an ep epileptic seizure, I had 800 times my own strength or 800 pounds of strength. Have you ever been sick? Neither of those make sense. 800 times your own strength seems pretty extreme. And then 800 pounds of strength is just a weight. So, like, I, I don't necessarily understand where this is. But if he did have seizures, I'm wondering if this is part of what pulled into his mental state as he's trying to deny being the monster that he was. I'm curious if he's going to try to play off of some of these different factors that play into his behavior. It's fascinating to make a note of, but I, oof. Also interesting, as soon as it comes around to psychology, which if you've watched the previous videos, when it comes around to psychology, he immediately seems to fall apart pretty quickly in his understanding. His recollection is very, very numerical oriented. So that is fascinating to be able to note. Let's keep watching. Ever been sexually abused by anybody? At the age of nine, there was a contractor. Uh, who building contractor? Building it building a house next door and he used to pick me up and take me for rides and always wanted to show me wrestling holds with always pinning my head in between his legs. But at the time I did not look at it as sexual. He was showing me wrestling holds where my head was always constantly pinned between his legs or under his legs. So I was 19. I'm going to go ahead and pause that there. So when he, when the interviewer brings up this point and Gacy kind of does a positional rechange. So this reposturing lets us know that there's going to be a change in tone and role on the next portion of what he's saying here. And he is a little bit more reserved on this part where he's talking about this relationship with a contractor that was working nearby. So with that, that is fascinating that we see that postural change. He does close up a little bit. So that is an indicator of some level of defensiveness, but there's no indicators of possible deceit. And the defensiveness does make sense if this storyline is genuinely true, which there isn't a reason for us to not believe that it's true right now. So if that's the case, then we're understanding just a little bit more about what formulated John Wayne Gacy. Let's keep watching. I was 19 when I ran away. And that was in, in 80, not 80, 60, 61. I went to Las Vegas for three months. Wow. Okay. 
So that was an interesting recollection of dates there. So this is a numerical thing. And he's been, throughout all of his interview, very, very on the point with numerical stuff, except for this here. Now we've come to this, not 80, 60, 20 years before, actually. I'm 20 years off on this. That's a pretty sizable difference. Perhaps it was just a mistake, but as you can see here, he does a lip compression and he has a very prolonged eye blink in there. His eyebrows are lowered and drawn together in concentration and recollection. I find this fascinating. He hasn't had to try this hard to recollect numbers in any other area of the interview except for this one here. So this is a little spike in his nonverbal communication. Let's see why that is. Took off, took my car and left. Yeah. I worked for Paul Mortuary, being the night man picking up bodies at the hospitals and stuff for them. I worked as a night man only. I did have nothing to do with the bodies. All this talk that I slept with the dead ones or, or had sex with dead bodies, that there is no truth to any of that. You did live in the um, mortuary. I lived in the mortuary, yes, but not in the embalming room. I mean, they make it sound like, you know, I slept in the crypts with them. And I never climbed into a coffin or anything like that. That dude is so damn ridiculous. Fake smile, not reaching his eyes fully. So this is obviously, he's not finding this very funny and he's still laughing along with it. Now this is designed and presented to coach us away from believing that specific narrative. Now, I don't know the physical evidence around that that drew people to believe that he did these things. But I will say that in this point, he is showing a very abnormal spike in his nonverbal communication that was not there before. We have not seen him try this laughter thing. He's breaking a lot of eye contact, a lot of nose shaking. Now, evolutionarily speaking, the smiling, the baring of your teeth can be a sign of, of vulnerability. Um, but in this area, it doesn't... Mm, I don't know that that's being the case here. From my understanding... People were a little weirded out by John Wayne Gacy living in a mortuary and working the night shift there and everything else considered in his storyline and what he's been accused of. I can understand why people would be weirded out by that. And he seems to be aware of how strange that would be, but he's displaying this odd nonverbal communication around it. Let's kind of see how this plays out and see what the narrative takes us. It, you know, it's the same thing. The contention is that I slept all night with Robert Peace. If you want to say I slept in the same house with a dead body, okay, fine, I'll, I'll buy that. But in the same room, no. And besides, the dead won't bother you. It's the living you got to worry about. I I felt... <laughs> okay, so this is also coming from the guy who woke up, came out of his house and saw a dead body on his floor and was like, oh, I'll just go about my day. So apparently he has no... Or very little. Not, I wouldn't say no, but he has very little difficulty around dead bodies. And he's saying, oh, it's the living that you need to worry about. And that is another fascinating aspect of Gacy's character, which adds a level of eeriness to the fact that he was also a children's clown who is just super comfortable around dead bodies. He's a complex character and not, not a very... Um, not a pleasant one, I would say. Let's keep watching. I felt things were going to work out because I knew that I didn't do the killing and I, I thought it would come out in the trial. But Amaranti, with, with this insanity defense... And I knew I didn't do the killing and it would come out in the trial. A constant no-shake in that. Now, a lot of them are micro. They're smaller in there. Could be, could be less controlled, meaning it's seeping out. It's a desynchronization point, meaning that he's possibly being deceitful here. But they also could be, I mean, they could be, they could be controlled. And if that were the case, he's saying you might not believe it, which then he understands that what he's presenting, evidence-wise, does not back up what he's now saying. Ergo, you wouldn't believe it. So... We're seeing this difficulty come out, even with his narrative, he's having difficulty figuring out a way to present the genuine evidence that was there in a way that wasn't implicative of him. Let's keep watching. Sanity defense, what I, and again, you can call it my ignorance of the law. It's like I explained in a letter to uh, Chief Justice William Clark. The evidence based is on the theory that the more sensational the case is, the more crazier it sounds, the insanity defense would work. And I still think it was stupid. I, I think that they did a disservice to me and they did a disservice to the victims. You know what people don't understand uh, is I, I feel I was wrongfully convicted for 33 murders and it was only because of sensationalism and ego. The displays police did a sloppy investigation. This, this is, uh, I mean, it may not be the, the correct way of wording it, but the thing of it is, is that they had other suspects and they, the had tunnel vision in to say, let's, it's Gacy's house. It's easier to put everything on Gacy. Hey, your paintings. Oh, okay. So 
this is the first time that I have heard Gacy mention the 33 victims. 33 victims that are involved in this, and he breezes right by it very quickly and focuses again on himself and how much people should pity him, and then he tries to shift things over to blaming law enforcement, that law enforcement didn't do their due diligence because, I mean, after all, all, all the bodies were found on my property, so it seemed as though it lined up most that way, which makes sense. That would be the easiest answer if somebody who has the history that Gacy has has the personality traits that Gacy does, if somebody has a couple dozen dead bodies under their house, and it's their house, it's not likely that anybody else was coming and stowing some dead bodies underneath another person's house. And that was what Gacy's defense was, is that somebody else, because he had given keys to everybody, so everybody had the opportunity to do it, somebody else had been taking copious quantities of these victims and putting them underneath his house and he never noticed. No, I'm sorry. Even just from the knowledge of Gacy himself, he seems to be fairly detail-oriented. I don't buy that. Put yourself in Gacy's shoes for just a tiny moment. Imagine having a house where people can come in and out regularly, but it's not an abnormally large house. It's not like a mansion or anything like that. So you have a pretty good idea of where everything is. And then your argument when people find over two dozen dead bodies under your house is that, well, somebody must have probably done that while I uh, wasn't paying attention. Okay. Maybe. You know what? Maybe. Definitely not, obviously, but like maybe for sake of devil's advocate here, maybe he just was really hyper clueless of it. So let's see. Hey, your paintings uh, have improved over the years. I think we've seen some... Uh... I think I've learned from each one of them. Uh, I guess it's the same reason why I relate to Michelangelo, because he, he was a workaholic, and Leonardo da Vinci. You know, people always ask me who my favorite artists are and why. Ooh, a sense of grandiose nature to himself, too. He relates himself to Michelangelo and Leonardo da Vinci. I don't see the similarities. We're understanding that Gacy does have this rather grandiose view of himself, comparing himself to somebody so famous as those people because he's a workaholic. Mm, okay. And why? And I did not know that Michelangelo was homosexual. It doesn't make no difference to me. He was a workaholic. He was a skull. Mm, that I'm not sure about. I did not know. So that that's synchronized. But if you see, we're seeing a little bit of this shoulder creeping in here with some lopsided shrugs. That's a sign of uncertainty and insecurity centered around this phrasing. Maybe, maybe Gacy didn't know, but he does have some insecurity around that. So that is something that we would want to be able to kind of focus in on and ask a little bit more around that. Why, why did this start acting up when he's talking about Michelangelo's relationships and romantic relationships? Fascinating. Let's keep watching. It was a sculpture. He was a he was a, a painter and, and did a lot of other things. Uh, da Vinci was a, an inventor in that. And of course, in, in my life, I've done painting, decorating, wallpapering. I've done mural work. You name it. As you know, I'm I'm a okay. <laughs> so unless I'm understanding this incorrectly gacy said that because michelangelo painted and gacy painted they were very similar um there are some differences but oh well let's go no i'm, I'm a bug about record keeping mm -hmm. all of my business records confirmed where i was who i was with what hotel i stayed at what what meals i ate everything was in the files and all of those files on december 29th of 1978 were confiscated by the Des Plaines Police Department. And those files there alone could have proven that I wasn't in Illinois when 16 of these murders, when they finally set the dates as to when these murders occurred. I, you did say that you, you never painted yourself as the innocent uh, babe in the woods. That you, We're going that, over the same thing. Yeah, not going to go in. Basically, no. But, I mean, the point is, is if, if... Okay. So he's now trying to say that his business records that he keeps were proving that he wasn't in these areas that murders happened at the time that they did. So he was trying to use his business records as an alibi and he's the one who runs the business records. Now, perhaps it was done through another portion of the company. Another person did that. So that could add some, some relevance to what he's saying. However, as the owner of the company, business records are far from concrete evidence as to say, oh, I was here or there or that and that. We're also getting to this one part where it sounds like we're circling back around to Gacy was at one point not presenting himself out to be this very innocent person and he's getting frustrated and so we're going to start seeing this frustration creep out here so let's see if if you feel that uh 
uh, you're not covering up your part of the, the crimes, but at the same time, you open up the thought that others were involved. Would you be willing to cooperate with law enforcement people today to uh, avail, say, the, uh, the materials that you have amassed and, and uh, to more or less pursue uh, if, in fact, there are others uh, that are on the streets that have been involved in these murders? Would you be willing to cooperate and to assist to, uh, to pursue that to the ends of uh, bringing others to justice? Would you be willing to do that? I get no qualms about that, but what I do no. Okay, so going through this, we're seeing all of these agitation gestures come out. We're seeing the self-soothing. He scratches his nose. He's doing a lot of mouth manipulators, lip compressions. His eyebrows are still drawn together and lowered. So we're seeing this reposturing and all of these manipulators come out that obviously lets us know that there is a large amount of agitation around there. And now, when he's asked, will you help with this? He says, I have no qualms with that. And he has a little micro head shake. No, but he's looking away. Let's see what his nonverbal communication says while he addresses this. Because what I'm already feeling from this with that little micro shake no, is that from here on out, he's going to somehow find a way to deny helping the research or the, the searching of the case, trying to figure out anything else around the case. Let's see if that's the case. Yeah, but what I don't understand is why wasn't it done to begin with, Bob? The thing of it is, they want you to believe that uh, I and I alone committed the, these murders, and and I had nothing to do with the murders of anyone. If anybody was involved, then how many people uh, are we talking about beside yourself? We believe there was four people involved, mm -hmm. and that would be uh, Michael Rossi, David Cram, uh, Philip Paskey. Here we, we've got a, a... Okay, so back to the point before he just quickly shifts off of that. He he does the micro shake no in there, but then he does not ever say, yeah, I would do that. I would help out with that. He immediately tries to shift blame and say, well, why wasn't it done already? Not the question, Gacy. The, the question is, would you help if you are actually innocent and you have all of this information? Why don't you help? Not really an answer that he gives. And now he's also trying to talk about how there's the possibility of these other people being involved, which sure, maybe there were other people that were helping Gacy out. Again, I still find it very, very difficult to buy the story that these other grown men were hauling so many corpses underneath Gacy's house without Gacy having any knowledge of it. I just, no, I, I'm sorry, no. The, uh, Philip Fasky, who would? had a, a newsletter going out of the Cook County Jail. And and here he is involved with a guy named John Norman. And John Norman was uh, running uh, Boys for Hire. They were making snuff films with young boys. To me, they were pimping them off. They were selling them. There, there was a crossover when we checked into John Norman's. So during that time, as he's looking down and kind of running through what it seems to be are his notes, he has a number of interesting nonverbal tells that pop up here. First, his pitch increases a lot. That's a sign of agitation, possible nervousness. We're also seeing this manipulator come up across here. It is semi-blocking him from the interviewer himself. Now, these sorts of brow touches like this can often come out in shame as well, which I find at very least just fascinating that we're hearing this increase in pitch and a little bit of shame. We're also seeing some more manipulators come up around his mouth and some lip compressions. These are all pushing me. Here's a spider right here. There's one last spider right there. All of these tells are not pushing me to feel that he's innocent or not at all involved in the situation, but let's just keep watching to see what's going on. On Norman's background, that he, he goes all the way back to uh, the early, uh, early 70s, involved in, uh, he ran the Norman Foundation, he, he run, run Epic International, and the Odyssey Foundation out of Dallas, Texas. And these were uh, organizations were wealthy men could uh, hire young boys for sexual for sexual weekends male prostitutes have you ever met norman have you ever had any contact with norman i have yet to see a current picture of him and and therefore i had to say no uh, i you know so paskey may have been with him at one time or another Ooh, okay i mm, have you met norman i have yet to see a current picture of him not the question not the answer that was needed and now he's also having some difficulty and we're showing some insecurity come in as we hear that pitch come in and he does a little bit of shrugging as well as he's now talking about well maybe in the past there could have been so let's see let's see how he tries to excuse this weird question dodge that he does and then all of these signs of adaptation time or another because see again i came home from out of town at times and phil paskey would be at the house drinking beer or something like that uh david cram is the one that brought 
uh, Phil Paskey and I just says, uh, Cram, when he wanted, he didn't want to do nothing. He got a hold of this guy and said, well, this guy can get you, uh, somebody for sex. I, I have a lot of things that I've forgotten that I can't remember. For instance, I can go back to my childhood and stuff and I still remember that, but yet you can, I can go into the seventies and there are a lot of things I can't remember. The same thing with the victims. I've looked at Ugh. Okay, so we're hearing a lot of vocal verbal difficulty coming from Gacy in this part. That means that he's at least somewhat unsettled psychologically, stumbling over his words. His brain is processing a little bit more. Ergo, we're hearing that reflected through his pattern, the flow of the speech that he has here. So something is causing him a substantial amount of agitation and difficulty centered around this meeting of a person who had these connections and not so ethical circles. So we're hearing this come out. That is suspicious to me. Uh, for me, at least while watching that, I would want to try to figure out how to pick around a little bit more, dig around, read around a little bit more in this area of things, because it seems as though there might be a little bit more of a relationship to these people than John Wayne Gacy himself was presenting. And now, now we're hearing that Gacy for the first time is trying to say, oh, well, I don't remember everything. Whereas before he has always been very, very insistent and adamant even that he does remember things. And so far he's been very, very accurate with his memory in regards to numbers and dates and times and activities and things like that. Not so much about psychology. And now we're hearing that perhaps maybe during this one time, he just can't remember an entire decade. Fascinating with go. I've looked at all of, I don't know. If you notice here, we got pictures of every one of the victims here. And believe it or not, for the last 12 years, I've studied these photos of the victims. And there is no, uh, we, we have a shot of all of the victims together here. And uh, when you look over at the, the photos, I have no recollection of any of them. Never met them. And we've gone over this more than once. They're just names and faces. And when you, when you look at them, uh, the thing of it is, we took it a step further. We went into their backgrounds. I wanted to know where they were at, what schools they attended, who they hung out with, and what kind of activities they were into. And that's what we dug up on each one of the victims. But still, there is no association. None of them never worked for me. None of them, they never went to any places that I ever hung around. Because I didn't hang around that many places, unless you were involved in politics. Or, or you, if you were involved in clowning, then I might have ran into you. But there's no way I could have run into any of them. They've got all that jury that doesn't belong to the victims. He's saying that he went and did all of his own personal research to all of these different victims. And again, we're not seeing any emotive reflection as to the, the grievous nature of what he's talking about. That's not necessarily implicative of him, largely because this is detached from that time. It would be nice to be able to see a level of, of grief centered around that many many deaths but at least he's uh, psychologically detached from it and his excuse is, is that i went and did all of these this digging and searching uh, as to their backgrounds and what they did and i don't recognize any of them which means that we just have to take him at his word for i don't recognize any of, of them and then his reason for backing that up is like I also probably would never have run into them because I didn't go around to the places that they went. Obviously didn't fly then, doesn't fly now. There's so many issues with that. Let's keep watching. Doesn't belong to the victims. They get the two clown suits that don't belong to the victim. Just like I consider myself the 34th victim, I consider the families victims as well because they did not get uh, justice from the shoddy investigation all the way down to... It That's fascinating that Gacy counts himself first and foremost counts himself as a victim and then it's a, like as a secondary thought he's like oh also i guess the families are kind of victims but I, I am a victim like i feel like i'm a victim during this situation it does feel lightly manipulative to me for him to try to group himself into the same group of what the actual vi victims experienced in their families it feels kind of gross to me that he's doing that especially considering all of the evidence that has been very, very firmly stacked up against him for him to still say, well, despite all of this, despite me having all of these victims underneath my house dead and buried, despite that, I feel like I should also be treated as if I'm a victim. Wow. Fascinating. Okay, let's keep watching. Uh, as I told you, when the FBI first came in to check out on me, you said that uh, you were kept out of the case back in 78, and that was only because of egos. They did not want a professional coming in and doing a, an investigation. So they did their sloppy investigation and let it slide that way. You see, 
everybody was so excited about the large, massive case, and everybody was looking with their egos as to how they could close this thing up. And you know the only one that they really have hurt? You've had the, the, the victim's family vent all their hostility towards me, and they think I, I'm the monster that killed their son or took out their son and stuff like that. When, in fact, most of them don't even have the remains of their own sons. And, you know, that's another thing everybody misses from this, is that the victim's families are, are not aware that, that in a lot of the cases, they don't even have the remains. That... That's really interesting. This this verbal patterning that he's going through. So first I'm seeing a number of he's breaking eye contact, but it seems as though he might be referencing his notes. He does have a very substantial dry swallow in there. That's a sign of agitation, nervousness. We see that crop up here. And then he's trying to say that, well, these families are mad at me because dot. But these families are mad at me and they're not, they don't even have the victim's remains from the police. So they should be mad at the police instead of mad at me for that. And the narrative that he seems to be painting is that there's something that the victim's family don't know. But then he kind of patches it up with this, they don't even know where the remains are. That doesn't feel like how that was where that narrative was going. I'm wondering what he was going to say about what the victim's family is genuinely don't know. Let's keep watching of their own, their own sons. Cause the Dr. Stein never turned over the whole body and they took the, uh, they took the heads off of each one of the victims. So when you, you turn over the remains to a loved, loved one's family, they don't have the whole body. What again, another pretty substantial manipulator coming across like that and head dipping eyes dart around when talking about the removing of the heads. This is a very fascinating uh, area that Gacy has kind of slid into to talk about and to really bring about into his narrative. And it, it is still designed and centered around trying to shift blame from himself over to law enforcement the, or whoever else that can possibly be blamed. That is something that Gacy's tried to do here. Fascinating. I'm going to keep watching. What do you actually feel that my investigation, that my case has been thoroughly investigated? I think, John, in a case like this, and I, I find this in many, many major cases that, uh, uh, Things are at the time of the case are done uh, uh, rather hastily because of the fact that uh, you know there's there's pressure on. Yeah, but that's a political answer. I know yeah. I, I don't I don't want a political answer from you. I want I want a, a basic answer. Do you actually think that the investigation in my case has been done right? I believe in your case that uh, that there's needs to be or there should have been more uh, more focus on on other insights. There should have been other insights checked out a little more thoroughly. That's that's the belief I've developed over these years. Yeah. Okay, so the interviewer during that part had a lot of difficulty. You could hear that through his ums and uhs and stutters and stops and his phrasing. So he's obviously feeling anxious and uncomfortable and agitated around that, which is a little bit of a power play from Gacy. Gacy's not supposed to be asking the questions here, but he does take control of the situation and ask that question and set the interviewer back a little bit. There's only a few more seconds left of this. Let's watch it and then we'll talk about it at the end. When it's yours. Yeah, I just think that we're kind of... Uh wrapping it up here we are uh, i think we accomplished something there uh, certainly we put something down on tape that uh, that has not been said my my feeling as a career law enforcement officer is that uh um uh, if john wayne gacy is guilty then he should be punished if john G or wayne gacy has others involved then they should be brought in they should be punished basically i believe in in total investigation and total justice and that's that's really what I, i've been looking for all along So what I'm seeing through Gacy at the very end, while the interviewer is kind of giving this overly gentle response to Gacy, is I'm seeing some level of disgust, contempt, perhaps dismay or disappointment as the interviewer is responding. And we're seeing that through a various number of tells across the face with the, the eye blocking, the slow blinks, the looking away, the little flashes of contempt or possible disgust that are coming across the lower half of his face. We're also seeing him do some more swallows in there and whatnot. So we're seeing all of these interesting aspects of John Wayne Gacy, and then it kind of wraps up the interview there. So in summary of all three different ones, we were able to see a number of very fascinating characteristic quality traits from Gacy and some inconsistencies that Gacy himself did present from his own side of things, even down to like, oh, well, I, I'm a fan, I have a fantastic memory in certain areas and in other areas, I just can't even remember whatsoever. And a lot of those areas that he couldn't remember whatsoever just happened to line up with areas that would be implicative of him. So of course, 
course he couldn't remember those areas, but if there were areas that were going to push people to believe his innocence, then his memory was faultless. And that in and of itself seems suspicious to me. Obviously, we're working well past the case here. This is all retrospect. He's guilty. Everything has gone through. But during that time, even without that knowledge, without hindsight being 2020, we would still be able to see a number of nonverbal tells that would push us to want to ask more questions, to want to involve more members of teams and interrogations and whatnot, to be able to dig a little bit harder because, frankly, the answers that he gave and the way that he presented them were suspicious. So let me know in the comments of this video if you would like to be able to see any other ones. I plan on going through and actually making a, a, a number of series on all of the various more prominent true crime serial killers throughout history so if there's any that you know that you would like to see maybe sooner than later let me know in the comments below if there are any other things on the internet or whatnot that you would like me to take a read at just let me again let me know in the comments below hit subscribe hit like all those things that you know everybody tells you to do but but without further ado that's all that i've got for the day my name is logan and you have been oh so awesome as you always are and i will see you in the next video Cheers, guys.